Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject today, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. With me is Dr. Eric Heiligenstein. Uh, Dr. Heiligenstein is the director of the University of Wisconsin Counseling and Consultation Center, Psychiatric Division, and he is a national expert on the subject who's had many publications in professional journals and has traveled the country talking about the subject. Uh, welcome, uh, Eric. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. How prevalent in America is ADHD? Well, in adults, the prevalence is estimated to be about 4.7 percent. A lot of people. A lot of people. Um, can you, you know, I think most people listening think they know what it is, but let's be sure we're on the same track. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what it is? Well, understanding ADHD in adults, uh, there's a couple ways to think about it. It's a developmental disorder with delays in time into normal brain changes, and it lies at the extreme end of a continuous distribution of specific mm. symptoms and underlying cognitive impairments. Oh, my gosh. Um, I have a little ADD. I, I had mm -hmm. a hard time absorbing that's not a very scientific. Is, is it just you can't sit still or you can't focus, or how would you put it in layman's terms? Well, what that really means is in individuals, there is a lifelong pattern of developmental delays in certain specific cognitive abilities and exec, what we call executive functioning abilities to plan, organize, pay attention, complete tasks. So they're kind of distracted all the time? or they? That can be one aspect of it, but that's uh, in a way somewhat simplistic way of looking at mm -hmm. one's life. When, what's happened in trying to think of, about this symptomatically, one loses sight of the global aspects of ADHD in the sense that it is a brain disorder that affects multiple aspects of one's life. Okay, so it's not something you pick up and learn because your parents were bad to you. It's it's actually a physical brain. That's Something's correct. Something's wrong with your brain. That's, Something's not right about your brain. That's correct. There are quantifi There's quantifiable brain pathology that's been identified in individuals with adult ADHD and children picked up on brain scans. Okay. If you, if you had to give a, a sort of a picture of the most typical way this plays out in adults' lives. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we think of it as a childhood disease, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. But really what we're talking to today is adults who have ADHD mm -hmm. and it affects their life. For someone 18 or over, mm -hmm. what are some of the more typical negative effects in life or difficulties it creates? Um, well, most people with the ADHD as adults have problems that start in childhood. Uh -huh. So as adults, it's a continuation of difficulties, or as yeah. we say, they leave a paper or electronic trail yeah. throughout their life. So the continuation of difficulties extend into most areas, uh, including academics, work life, personal, romantic relationships, family relationships. Well, I, hey, Eric, I've got problems, and I don't have ADHD. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of in terms of the kind of problems mm -hmm. that might be and there are particularly some are, unique to Right, and there are some that are very specific to ADHD. Like what? The academic difficulties are, are well known in the sense of academic struggles in most areas. Yeah. Uh, work difficulties, people with ADHD have difficulty in holding jobs and lose more jobs compared to people without oh, oh, ADHD. Really? What, what kind of thing happens at work that causes them to lose jobs? Um, many people don't stick with their jobs or have difficulties with job performance. Uh -huh. able to do basic job tasks so their job performances are worse. And when you say they can't stick with their job? Um, you mean they get bored? Or get they... bored with their jobs, get frustrated with their jobs, yeah. um, unable to stick with their job performance and just leave. Yeah. Um, is, is there anything, I, I want to know more about this, but just mm -hmm. as a sidetrack, mm -hmm. is there anything positive about having ADHD? Is there any benefit? Um, I think that's kind of like a, a urban myth in the sense of positivity about it. Uh, each individual may have some benefits they see from it, but uniformly studies show that ADHD comes with a large amount of uh, medical and psychological morbidity. Yeah, so. so in the say that there's some blessing to having ADHD, most of the studies say uh, the preponderance of evidence says no, there is not. It's nothing good about it, it's just a problem, just it's, trouble. It's, for, most people, it's, for most people, it's a problem. There may be some unique benefits it instills in some people, but the preponderance of evidence says that problems will outweigh the benefits. Okay, this person, what I've heard, mm -hmm. is, well, hey, if you've got something like you're a hockey player and mm -hmm. you've got to be busy with ten mm -hmm. things at once, hey, this is perfect. It may be perfect, but the rest of that hockey player's life may be awful. Oh, okay. They may be divorced multiple times. They may have substance use problems. They may have a terrible driving record. 
all because of their ADHD, but they may be a great hockey player, but that's not a tremendously satisfying life because they can't play hockey all their life. So listening are some people who are thinking, that's my partner, my spouse, or, mm -hmm. or that's my friend or my kid. In an adult relationship, mm -hmm. what are the problems of being on the other side of a person who's got ADHD? Well, people with ADHD have trouble with relationships. Oh. They're married um, more often. They're divorced more often. Really? Um, so their romantic relationships are another area that stand out as difficult and problematic, too. Okay, so the so partner on the other side are often the people that prompt and bring in individuals for evaluation. Yeah, you take a look at my husband here. He's got problems. Right. Yeah. And the kind of problems I would assume is, hey, you want to talk to your spouse and they're not a good listener, right? That, that could be one, but there's multiple other reasons for that, too. <laughs> yeah, that's not a lot of good listeners, period. But I would think ADHD people would have a particular hard time. So living with a person with ADHD, be, besides their bad listening, what other kind of things might you find? Well, from an early age, people with ADHD have, very, have great difficulty reading social cues and are difficult with reciprocity in social relationships. Is so, that something like Asperger's? Uh, not to that degree in the sense of that inability, but children with ADHD are often pointed out by their peers as, as ones who are difficult to have good peer relationships with, difficulty mm -hmm. in interacting with, and that carries over into romantic relationships too, that they miss social cues of conversation, miss social cues of needs, and in adult relationships that oftentimes plays out. And again, if someone is very symptomatic with adult ADHD, it comes down to just basic inability to do things where another partner tends to overcompensate in the sense of getting things done, managing the home, paying the bills, doing tasks that the other partner is sometimes incapable of doing. And that mismatch in the relationship can oftentimes cause great difficulty because the other partner at some point will just say, I just can't do this for you all the time. I would think that if you think of someone dating and then getting married, that when you're dating someone with ADHD, that wouldn't be as problematic as no, when you're married. No, exactly right. Exactly right. The typical pattern that one might see clinically or as, as, as a um, mental health provider is that over the years, that overcompensation tends to make the, the relationship very imbalanced mm -hmm. to the point that it implodes or just stays at this pathological yeah. pattern over time. Uh, the imbalance being that the there's a caretaker. Sir. There's a caretaker or someone who overcompensates. Yeah. And when you say they divorce more, any idea how much more? Is it significantly more? It is significantly more, yes. Wow. How many people you think there are, percentage-wise, or some kind of idea on this, uh, adult sufferers of ADHD who don't know or haven't been diagnosed with it? I don't have good data about that. Um, what Clinically, what we see more are people who come in who think they have ADHD who actually don't have ADHD, and there tend to be other problems. Okay, you're, you're director mm -hmm. of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin mm -hmm. Counseling Center. What percentage of people who come in saying, I have ADHD and need help or drugs for mm -hmm. it, actually have it? Less than 10%. No kidding. Yeah, very, very few. Why do so many people self-diagnose with it when they don't have it? Um, it's, it? It's been so written about in the media. I think people latch on to it very quickly. And it seems to be destigmatized compared to other type of mm. mental health problems because of that. So it's easier to say I'm, I have ADHD than say I'm anxious or I'm depressed, insecure, depressed, have a substance abuse problem, all those types of things yeah. are much more stigmatized. But in this, in this day and age, the likelihood of somebody as an adult walking in being unrecognized with ADHD is so small. Really? That that's why there's such a skew in the numbers. So people who have it know it. People who don't have it think they got it. No, it's more that people who have it in today's academic system are generally picked up at an early age. Yeah. School systems are very sensitized to ADHD. Some school systems are so sensitized, states have passed laws preventing teachers from <laughs> sending, you know, recommending to parents that they get their students tested because of that. There have been such problems of, of overreaction. Yeah. But you have to look at it from a societal standpoint or a, a system standpoint. Most 
students are picked up at an early age because the system is so sensitized mm -hmm. to academic failure and academic remediation and academic problems. For someone to waltz through K through 12 and not be diagnosed with ADHD is almost unheard of nowadays, wow. unless there are very unique mitigating mm -hmm. factors, which are possible. But the majority of people, if they, had, don't, if they have ADHD, are going to be picked up. Okay. The school system will notice something. The parents will notice something. And they'll be evaluated. And since it starts in childhood. Since it starts in childhood. By the time you're 25, you'll know if you have ADHD you ever did, right? Exactly. Okay. You know, the, another urban myth is that I'm perfectly fine throughout my life, and at age 22, all of a sudden I get ADHD. Yeah. That does not happen. Which that, you see a lot of it in your counseling Which center. you see a lot of, and you think people, you know, say, well, it's, you know, I just was smart, or I had an easy high school or all other types of reasons that that's not what ADHD is. Okay, so if you think your husband has mm -hmm. it, what questions do you want to ask your husband to make sure that he doesn't? You know, think, this guy's driving me crazy living mm -hmm. with him. He's so forgetful, he messes up the books, he doesn't listen, um, and you think maybe he's got it. How do you, how do you detect if it's possible? Well, I think those that level of detail question has to come from a professional. Oh, actually. you're not. <laughs> if, if you're not a professional, who is? You're an expert. But I, I mean, that, okay. Let me let me age, hypothesize. If you ask your husband, how did you how did you do in grammar school and high school? You, those would be questions, right? And, and you know, and the questions that they give you clues that somebody would would be somebody that had difficulties. You right. know, repeated grades, required tutoring had a very, you know, uh, average academic history, or okay. maybe failed some classes. And Those it, types of things would be academic markers right. of difficulty. That school was easy, I didn't study, I got very good grades is not what people with ADHD do for the most part. Some people with a certain subtype of ADHD do well in school, the hyperactive subtype, if mm. they stay in school. But because of their hyperactivity and impulsivity, the rest of their life leaves trails of difficulties, generally okay. with behavioral problems, okay. conduct difficulties, sometimes legal problems and substance use. So their lives aren't free okay. of difficulty either. Those my, are the bad, my bad boys and girls. My bad because I didn't ask you to differentiate between mm -hmm. ADD and people who have the hyperactivity. Right, issue. there's three subtypes. There's the inattentive subtype. Those t that subtype, if that's what someone has, they tend to have academic impairment as their major problem. Okay. even though the impairment spills over into other areas too, particularly with driving social relationships and other problems. Yeah. But academics is one of the biggest. Okay. And are people most with people that, with ADHD? Uh, the inattentive subtype is the most prominent. Most, okay. Then there's the hyperactive subtype. Okay. Individuals with that, their prominent difficulties and behavior problems, you know, conduct difficulties, aggression, um, substance use problems, bad boys and bad girls. Uh, are they kids who can't sit still kind of thing? Is that um, they're the ones who think without acting. Yeah. Leap okay. without looking. Uh -huh. And ones, you know, if there are without social support systems, may, you know, uh, delve into criminal activity. Oh. And as I mentioned, substance use is a huge, huge risk factor. But not which necessarily bad students. If they can stay in school, their academics may not be negatively affected, but a lot of them, because their behavior is so bad, they're pulled out of school, which the more school you miss, the worse you do. Well, of course. Right. The third subtype is the combined. Individuals that have both, and those do worse <laughs> than anybody because they have both. How common is a subset? That's the smallest subset, but those are the ones that do the worst on every measure in the sense of their academic achievement, how far they do in school and everything. So, but, you know, where we were starting about, you know, when you're looking at someone as an adult and you look backwards, most adults have evidence growing up of some of these problems. And it's very unusual nowadays for someone just to waltz through the system and be totally unnoticed. You know, there are some unique factors that may explain why someone might have not been noticed. Um, you know, sometimes, and, and you can pick those up as a clinician and then explain that. Mm -hmm. There may be families who, you know, yeah, I was tested in the fourth grade. My parents didn't believe in it. They just did not want me treated, you know. But there's still a history there. It's not as if the person had no problems whatsoever. You know, or um, you may have people who moved multiple times during their lives, and they weren't in school systems long enough to actually be tested. Military families is one example with that. Or people who traveled the world. My father was internationally, you know, in two or three countries while I was growing up. We've had students like that. Yeah. 
Um, but some, sometimes even then there will be evidence. Sometimes people were homeschooled. Yeah. You, you know, it's difficult for those types of things. So there are sometimes unique factors that will come up. But for the majority of people, there aren't those things that stand out. And going to an easy high school isn't a reason for not having problems. Okay. So let's talk about treatment. Yeah. So someone is diagnosed, they do have a case of, mm -hmm. uh, and let's say it's attention deficit they've got, and they're inattentive. Mm -hmm. What are the m modalities of treatment? Well, in a perfect world, most people would start treatment with cognitive-based therapies to help them. But there aren't enough therapists now that can do those therapies or willing to do those therapies. You know, there is good research showing that that can be very effective for adults. Okay. Maybe give us a little information mm -hmm. how that works. You're talking about changing people's thinking? Changing people's thinking, helping them with their organizational skills, helping them with their task completion, giving them real, you know, a toolbox with hands-on skills to help them, helping them with their social relatedness, okay. helping them really to use and build up inherent skill or tasks that they can use on an everyday basis. It sounds like you like that better than going right to meds. Absolutely. Why? Well, the research that's available shows that that can absolutely be effective for many, many people without having to take medication. But well, isn't it, I mean, it's easier to just take a pill. If it's makes. easier to take a pill. So? So, well. Why are you, why are you such a uh, difficult uh, doc? I mean, a pill solves the problem, you take water, a pill, done. Right, right. Well, the problem with the medications nowadays is they've, be, they've become a huge, huge problem from abuse and diversion. Mm -hmm. So giving the medications away, like M&Ms, you know, as physicians now, we have, I, I personally, you know, I'm very, very cautious about who I prescribe to. Okay. But if my wife has ADHD, mm -hmm. I'm not worried about her being a drug pusher. I want her to feel better, and I mm -hmm. want to have a better wife. Mm -hmm. Um, so why wouldn't it be best for her to just take the meds? Well, you know, that's the decision we decide in the sense of what level of treatment is the best to start with. Yeah. Same reason that, you know, if you go to your doctor with back pain, they're not going to start you on morphine. I see. So it's, there could be some side effects, too, from There the can be side effects. There's risks with every treatment. You need to start the treatment at the level that's best for the patient. And sometimes starting with early minimal interventions is the best because you get the best results. You don't wow. have to start with the most and highest risk treatment for everybody. Well, let's take a little look at this mm -hmm. cognitive behavior therapy for, mm -hmm. if you have trouble focusing because there's something wrong with your brain, mm -hmm. and you said the brain's different if you have right. ADHD. Yep. So your brain is different. Logically, I would think that means do something chemical because your brain is different. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, no, let's do cognitive behavior therapy first. Is the first to... Mm -hmm. Okay, if... Uh, the behavioral and CBT doesn't work too well with someone, mm -hmm. then I assume you go to drugs. And medications are an important treatment, and many people are on medications, particularly with more severe forms of the disorder. Okay. And I keep hearing about Adderall and Ritalin. Are mm -hmm. those, am I hearing that right? Those are stimulants that are available. Stimulants? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you drank 10 cups of coffee, would you feel better if you had ADHD? Uh, actually, the research that's looked at that showed that some people get better and some get worse and some have no change whatsoever related to caffeine. Caffeine's a very different uh, pharmacological compound than the stimulants are. Okay. So you take that and it causes you to be more stimulated or why does it work? No, there are specific drugs that enhance the executive functioning of the brain. Hmm. So that's the part, of, again, since this is an executive function disorder, the part of the brain that is related to overseeing how we plan, how we organize, how we do things in our lives. These drugs enhance that functioning. Okay, and I take it you see many students at the University of Wisconsin who want that drug. Who, mm -hmm. And if they do have ADD, mm -hmm. ADHD, and they take it, do they report immediate uh, results? And most people who take the drug get benefit. The, the response rates are quite high, close to about 75%. Wow. And how about, I'm sure you've heard this, someone says, well, I know it works because I my roommate had it and I tried it right. and I studied better. You've right. heard that, right? Mm -hmm. All the time, unfortunately. <laughs> Why is that unfortunate? Well, because, well, it's unfortunate because it's, uh, it's a felony to distribute the medications like that. Um, and it's uh, basically an inaccurate assumption. How's that? I mean, if, if you studied better, why is it inaccurate? Uh, it doesn't mean you have ADHD for one oh, thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, People then. assume that. All right. Well, wait yeah. a minute now. If 
if it does improve your functioning, mm -hmm. it's easier to focus. Right. What? Why not? If you're having trouble with the subject or whatever, just occasionally take a pill mm -hmm. so you can do better. Um, there's if lots, you don't have ADHD. Right. There's lots of different reasons. I mean, from ethical reasons to medical reasons that you can span the spectrum. You know, some ethicists would say there's probably nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, I, I tend to disagree with the pure ethical standpoint, but I can see why they say that. I mean, from one, at this point still, it's, it's illegal. You mean it's like using drugs in a baseball game, enhancing your performance it's, it's, is not it's fair? It's performance enhancement. So yes, from one standpoint, it's not fair because not everybody has access and will take them and can take them. So it is performance enhancement um, because they do have a non-specific effect of uh, promoting wakefulness. I mean, th from one standpoint, there's been no studies that show that they actually truly enhance performance, but oh. people still take them, so they must be doing something. That's interesting um, because they do help the performance of a person who's got ADHD. Yes, they do. But no, no proof they help non-ADHD right. people. Right. They help you stay awake. They do. So for many people hypothesize what they're doing is in bringing people up to where they should be because many people who actually misuse the drugs are misusing other substances, which put them below where they should be. But they're not, they're not a miracle cure for people with ADHD is what I'm hearing. Oh, not at all. Really? Not at all. So you've had... Uh, uh, patients who mm -hmm. had ADHD, you've given them drugs and they haven't responded? Uh, yeah, close to 25% of people don't respond oh to medication. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you send them to a psychotherapist to get some help that way if that doesn't work. That way or try different medications, lots of different things you might do. Coaching, you know, wow. ADHD coaching is something that can be helpful to people also. To keep them organized and mm -hmm. compensate? Mm -hmm. Um, and the executive or the person in the, uh, working for the government or whatever mm -hmm. who has this, what percentage of adults, uh, you're saying almost every adult who has it knows it, they learned it somewhere along the line. How many people out there are really suffering and having poor performance in their work because of this disease, for lack of a better word? Is it common that people just can't do their job? I wouldn't, I don't know that. No idea. No idea. No idea. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that everybody who has it knows they have it. There are some people who have significant co-occurring problems that may overshadow their ADHD, you know, particularly people with substance use disorders, people with criminal behaviors and, you know, outright sociopathic personalities that their ADHD is so drowned out by what they do that they may have no clue. Now, I've heard that there are a lot of family docs, internal medicine docs, that say it sounds like ADHD and they give a drug. That's correct, unfortunately. You want to expand on that? Uh, it's outside what, it's pretty much what's outside their scope of practice, but it does happen. Often? Yes, it does. Yeah, in primary care, yeah. Why are they doing that? I have no clue because people who, you know, are in primary care and leaders in primary care say they shouldn't be doing it. But they're doing it. But they're doing it. Probably to make their patients happy. Uh, you know, in primary care, unfortunately, with how busy they are, to get someone out of their office, you're exactly right. Because it's more difficult to say, hey, this is why you don't, and this is what we need to do, because that takes time. Now, other, I've, I've often heard, uh, what do you call these, witches tales about ADHD, mm -hmm. that it's got a lot to do with our culture that the rise, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, in ADHD mm -hmm. is because of computers and busy lifestyles mm -hmm. and things like this. Do you buy into that? No, I mean, ADHD was first identified by a pediatrician in 1902. Oh, really? So, I mean, there weren't too many Macintoshes in 1902. Not too many. No. How does, given, let's say, that the same proportion of our population has it as did then, mm -hmm throw ADHD into our culture now versus a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Is it a more difficult or an easier disease to cope with untreated in a culture of computers? And right. Society? Well, the difficulties doesn't have to do with our technology. The difficulty, I think, you know, a hundred plus years from now compared, then compared to now is what people with ADHD can do with their lives. I mean, research with what adults with ADHD actually do with employment show many ADHD adults are self-employed. Oh, really? And as you know, because it's it's a lot easier for them to manage what they do rather than have a boss. Rather than have a boss or be in a regimented job, that it may be more difficult to meet performance goals. Mm -hmm. 
stay on performance, stay on task. When you're self-employed, you can kind of manage that yourself. Okay. Um, 100 years ago, it was a lot easier to do that, a lot easier to have a good job. Be on the farm. Do whatever. Yeah, a farmer wouldn't have too hard a time, right? No. Compared to a person working a job nine to five. Yeah, a lot lot more self-employed opportunities years ago in our country than there are right now. There's still a lot, but they're... That's, it's yeah. different. And I would assume someone who worked in a factory 80 years ago just doing repetitive tasks would have an easier time than someone who's working in uh, a complex Possibly. office situation. Possibly so, too. Yeah. yeah, That's probably the biggest shift in the sense of what opportunities are available for employment versus now in the sense of a shift in culture. And in terms of getting education. In the same, too. Exactly. Education wasn't, you know, you don't have to go to college 100 years ago now. And college for ADHD is, like, awful. It's the worst thing you can do for somebody to say go to college and have ADHD. I mean, because of the difficulties, you know, they're, they're you know, prior to modern treatments, you know, 50% of people with ADHD never made it to college. Compared to what for the general population? I, I, I don't know what that is for a general population. But less. But, ugh, yeah. Not less. Yeah. I mean, Not most less. of them get to college and don't even graduate in, prior yeah, to modern that's, treatments. I wasn't, you're ahead of me because I wanted to ask the graduation rates of people with ADHD versus the other population. I don't have it compared to the regular population. I just have it for ADHD. Yeah. But the you know graduation rates you know low, you know twenty percent. Really? So twenty percent. Yeah, that's data. that's you know over ten years old. Oh, I don't that's have pretty close. Recent data. So you know you can see before you know twenty or thirty forty years ago if you didn't have to go to college and get a job. Twenty. That's a that's a staggering staggering number. number. Well, fifty wow. percent didn't go to college. But if so four out of five people with ADHD don't make it to get to their degree when they start college. Uh, I know the numbers are well above half for the general population, mm -hmm. but let's say they saw Dr. Eric Heiligenstein mm -hmm. their first day freshman year, mm -hmm. got diagnosed, got appropriate treatment. Do you think it would still put them behind the eight ball to have it and, and be there, treated? Uh, all I could say is they, their margin for error would be much, much still smaller. But untreated? Forget untreated, about it. the margin of error is like razor thin. Wow. Wow. You know, but again, you're right, 50 years ago, you had choices. You didn't have to go to school to get a good job. And now your choices are so limited. Your, people with ADHD have a much, much more difficult situation to be in because of the educational achievement for them to get through college is just so much more difficult. In the minute or two we have yeah. left, is there anything about ADHD that you want to make sure people take away from this discussion, the misconceptions, uh, mis uh, uh, applications. That would be I think useful we to... covered the biggest misconceptions. Okay. I think we covered it. You know, just because you take Adderall doesn't mean you have ADHD, and just because high school is easy doesn't mean you have ADHD. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and if school was easy all the way through, the odds are very small that you have ADHD. Okay. Exactly. Well, exactly. Dr. Eric Halligenstein, thanks very much for joining us and helping Thank us you. out here. All right. I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights.